I have a whole history to tell you, but I, you know, <clears throat> can I, let me say it this way. I was taught to preach in an ethnically different reality than this is, okay? Randy's good, <laughs> but, me, but I was taught with a B3 and, uh, and a mic in your hand and, a ear to, and a hand to your ear. <laughs> Say yes, somebody. <laughs> Fossil Stroman knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so when you get this thing in your hand from that experience, you just kind of revert uh, to what you're used to doing. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it can affect the delivery of the message. So uh, my intention this morning was not to use that type of delivery so that I could expound. Don't do that to me. <laughs> so that I could expound the word of God the way I felt it this morning. But I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to be here again this is this is a home to me and my younger brother if y'all didn't know he was younger than me <laughs> he is younger actually just got a copy of a family a photo uh, and looking for a color copy of a photograph of the eight of us in 1965 uh, and the two of us were sitting in this chair, surrounded by the other six. And uh, it's, you have to remember we were that small. Yeah, we we're leaning heads, both of us kind of needing to be propped up by a brother on my side, sister on his side, just kind of keeping us in place long enough for the photographer to take the picture. And uh, it's, it's quite poignant because now uh, I'm looking at his grandchildren and my grandchildren and, and uh, I'm like, wow, you know, it's been a long journey, you know, and uh, do I have a clock back there or, or what? Am I, what have you got? I, oh, yeah. okay. I'm just wondering if I'm on a timetable so I, I don't mess up. Am I okay, Robin? She, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to mess up because I know how things go. I, I'm used to the Apostle Tommy Lee Roberts saying, give me, give me, give me how many, 45 or whatever. And, uh, and Sister Tina, she's on the point back there. So, uh, but anyway, um, so since uh, the mic just kind of threw me off flow, let me see if I can get back in there and say thank you uh, for this honor uh, to speak this morning. I haven't spoken on Sunday morning here in a few years. And... Uh, then it wasn't in this building, but I'm looking at these your powerful faces, and I'm balancing right now um, anointings, and giftings. Uh, some of you understand that because uh, I am consecrated as a presiding bishop of a fellowship of churches, international fellowship of churches, and uh, just talked to a pastor in Kenya the other day. And uh, he's, he's, he's a constantly faithful man. Um, and I thought about it. I said, wow, I still have the responsibility of that. I, on Saturday, I had to deal in a negative form with another pastor. And, uh, and I was like, Lord, you know, you know, it's been a while since I had to administratively operate as a bishop to handle some issues in the kingdom and I didn't ask for the assignment and that was truly one that was thrust upon me about 20 years ago this July I'll be 21 years uh, in that office but the my greatest uh, uh, and the most exciting authority now is as an apostle because that's where I get to do the work of ministry where I get to go and launch and plant and activate and release anointings in people like yourselves, um, where I'm not just sitting somewhere fielding phone calls and, and admonishing leaders to hang in there, you know, be faithful, God will do it, you know, I'm good at that, but I want to be real at that, 
you know what that's got to be real you got to have an impact when you do that and so but the, it's more exciting to be in the battle be in the battle because we've already won the war y'all know that right <laughs> the war the war was won a long time ago but we still battle on a daily basis because the devil's not he doesn't care he knows he's defeated y'all know that I mean we call him the devil but you know this okay I don't want to go too deep on you but we call him the devil but Lucifer has extended a, an influence in the earth and uh, you know you can, you're more more accurate to call him Satan but he really Lucifer was the source of a lot of this mess and and uh, he, he has found some comrades in darkness that operate against us. So when we say the devil did this or Satan did that, he didn't because there's only one of him. And he can't, he's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. <laughs> and he's not omnipotent. Somebody say hallelujah on that. See, I told you this thing would get you in trouble. <laughs> because he's not what God is. Oh, glory to God. He is not what God is. So he, one of the things I love about that is he is not long-suffering. He's going to give up on it after a while. He might be messing with your brother Dave, but he's going to quit when you don't quit. If you keep praising him, he's going to give up. He's like, I've tried everything to stop him, but he's still praising God. I worked against his life. I worked against his money. I worked against his family, but he still loves God. And he'll say, man, somebody else take over because I can't change his mind. Amen. Glory to God, he's not long-suffering. I think that blesses me more than anything because I know it's going to battle against this issue is going to wear out after a while. Amen. This thing I'm dealing with now is going to pass away. Amen. Glory to God. And something else may come, but God's going to give me a time of refreshing in between. I won't have to fight every moment of every day. There's a praise time here. Glory to God. There's a worship time in there. There's a rejoicing time in there. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, hell to me, Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. I love that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And this right here is, is, a, is a historic reality. Even though I've been preaching a long time. I don't think I've ever had an occasion where my brother and I preached this. Well, I don't know. Did they, you know they know. Okay, but anyway, where we've ever preached the same day, even though this wasn't designed that way, you know. And one of the things I'm aware of is that the anointing is the anointing. And Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit, and it's his word. It's his job. It's his work. And all we do is participate. We participate. We don't spectate. Come on now. We're not sitting on the sidelines. We're involved in this process, and God has a plan, and his plan is always perfect. The Bible says he doeth all things well. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what we feel like in it. Man, I got some stories. I'm trying not to tell them all, but he doeth all things well. Amen. Amen. All things well. And then we can jump over there because we got enough word in here in, 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 in uh, number... Uh, 828, you know, that, that all things work together for the good to them who are the called according to his purpose, who love him, love him, and are called according to his purpose. So it's all going to work together. Oh, wait a minute. Let me make sure. Anybody in here love him? Oh, okay. Anybody in here know you're called to his purpose? So it's all going to work together for your good. You, have, you really don't have to worry about it. And if I really want to make you a little bit stirred up, you know, worry is a sin. I had somebody tell me, you know I'm a worrier. I said, well, then I wish you'd quit sinning. And they got offended. I mean, hot offended. I'm not a sinner. I said, you told me you were a worrier. You said it. I didn't. The Bible says take no thought. No thought. Take no thought, because you got to take it. You got to agree with it. You got to say amen to it. Come on, somebody. So if you don't take it, you don't have to deal with it. You don't have to worry it, because they cast all my care on him, 
because he's the one that's taking my care. He's in charge of my future and my destiny. I'm trying to get back on course, but I'm in a flow. I'm trying to get it, get it, get it back. See, Apostle, you ain't supposed to do that like that. Just let me stop and do this. And as I again say thank you for this, uh, this opportunity. Whether you know it or not, I really can preach in about 10, 15 minutes and sit down. But I'm just overwhelmed. <laughs> I've had to do it before. Done it on TV. <laughs> done it in major conferences. They say, you ain't got, you know, five minutes. I had one brother say, can you give me two? <laughs> two minutes, the whole church was running. I said, that's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> two words. That's the Holy Ghost. I can. And the Holy Ghost took over. Yeah, I had to grow up like I did. <laughs> so, so I know it can be done. It's just that after you've added 45 years to this thing, you know, and you've been releasing others, you get a whole lot in you. And so you have to, you need the Holy Ghost, you need the Holy Spirit to temper the release. He has to control the release process. Because he's the one that poured it all in there. So he picks in there and he moves in. I, mean, I feel like preaching right now. He gets inside there and he says, uh, pull this out and, and talk about Dave and his hugs and, <laughs> and, and all the work they're doing. Come on, somebody. And he, he controls the output because he's trying to control the impact. See, it's his purpose that dictates what comes out because he knows what you need. He knows what the atmosphere requires in order for the church to be impacted enough to reach this region and beyond this region, somebody's going to reach the earth. Hello, somebody. So this is not mine, it's his. And the only proof of whether or not it's mine or his is how I am able to sit down when it's time for me to sit down. If he says that's enough, I say, here you go. Say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I'm trying. I really am. Glory to God. So um, this is the first time we've ever ministered on the same day. And, uh, and I was kind of overwhelmed last night after we were communicating. And I was like, man, he would have to mess me up. And, and, uh, and the Lord ain't really given me what to say before I knew about Dr. Savell. And we lift him before the Lord continually because he's got a lot more to do. Amen, somebody? And we, and you know what's important? I've had to, God has had to, for my life, add uh, prayer warriors. Because I had, I lived in a reality, some of y'all don't know, I've been on international television. Um, you know, I used to get uh, requests for a job from other countries. You know, oh, great bishop, can I come and work in your ministry? I'll sweep the floors. Of, you know, people, we travel and ministered in Africa. By the time I got back from Africa, I had all these people begging to come. And, and, and what can I do? Can I, can I cut the grass for you? And I'm like, y'all know, no, we, I don't have it like that. Y'all you know, see me preaching on TV, and you think preaching on TV means we got this huge facility somewhere with all these people and all this money. And, and Dave, it's not like that. It wasn't like that. We just stepped into the favor of God, the timing of God, the plan of God. And I got news for you. You may not have a lot of money, but if you got favor, it might not be fair, but it's available. You can get some favor. Look at somebody and say, I can get some favor. Now tell them again, say, I got some favor. I got some favor. That favorite thing just jumped on me. You know why that is, right? Yeah, okay. All right. I'm in the atmosphere. You know? But really, that's all we did. We stepped in the favor of God, the timing of God. And we were on television twice a week around the world for $89. Now, that's the favor of God. Because like, you can't get that today. Uh, $89 for an international television broadcast. They hadn't even, when we stepped into the station, I just, just started a ministry in Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> It was our second plant, and, uh, you know, we were determined. Now, what started was the people, when we got there to do a crusade, the people said the established, well, the Church of the Chosen Frozen, they invited us to leave town. We don't need you here. We ran Benny Hinn out of town, and we're going to run you out of town, too. 
That's what they said. I said, well, you know, you just, you just messed up now. You challenged. When they come out, this is the word. When the devil comes out against you, he's not coming out against what he sees. He's coming out against what's in you. I knew that greater was he, is he, who is in me than he who is in the world. And I'm like, well, you just issued a challenge to the Holy Ghost. You didn't issue a challenge to me. So I turned and said, do you want me here? And he said, go to the television station. We went to the television station. And when we stepped in, we asked, how much do you all charge for a television broadcast? And they said, well, how long do you want to be on? I said, well, you know, about 30 minutes, you know, uh, for a show. And, uh, we, you know, we just want to know how much it costs. They said, well, if you sign today, we've got two slots available a week for $89 a slot. Can you handle that? I said, yeah. I looked, I looked at my friend, Apostle Hodges. Y'all have not met him. I said, we can handle that. He was like, yeah, I'll take one, you take the other. Contract. I don't even think I touched the bottom. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. See, I don't like these things anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Kelsey. But once we signed the contract, she said, now I got to tell you something. She said, you signed at the right time. You're in the right place at the right time. That's a word for you. She said, Monday, we go international. The satellite feed will be hooked up, and everybody in the world will be able to see your broadcast. I was like, oh, what did you just say? I looked at the pastor, I, just, I said, did, did you hear what I heard? He said, well, it looks like we're going to be international preachers, brother. I said, well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We had a little dance right there in the studio lobby. Then, that wasn't good enough. He turned around when we got outside. He said, you know, I don't need that. He said, I don't have the ministry you have. He said, so I want to sow that other night, day into your ministry as well. I was like, you mean, what do you, uh, say that again. And he said, well, instead of going on once a week, you go on twice a week. I was like, look at God. <laughs> so we ended up doing that for over a year. And uh, in that time, we reached all over the world. And then I realized that the prophetic over my life that said, you're going to preach to the world was real. See, we don't always understand how somebody prophesies to us and how it can be uh, uh, manifested in our lives. And I had heard that since I was a child. You'll preach to the nations all over the world. And I'm like, oh, praise God. Well, I'm thinking I'm getting ready to travel everywhere. You know, that can wear you out. I've done it. It can wear you out. But when you get on TV and they go everywhere just because of the technology of the world, I mean, I was preaching to the nations. I was in... Asia and Africa and South America and Europe and man, I'm getting all kinds of responses and people started giving and I'm like, whoa, this is pretty good and you know, God was in it. So we've done all that and I said all that, not intentionally that way, but to get to the point of saying there is no greater honor than preaching here today. Amen. Nothing more impactful for my life. See, if ministry doesn't matter to me, it really, you know, you, you might get something, but if it doesn't matter to me, then I really haven't done anything. Because the Holy Spirit has to speak to me and through me and for me first before you get anything. Because otherwise, I'm just putting on a show. I want him to put the show on. He who hath begun a good work in you shall perform it. That word perform if you look it up, it means he puts the show on. It's not us that puts the show on. It's him that puts the show on. I want him to show out. Christian, I want him to put the show on today. After all I've said so far, when it's all said and done, I want you to say, man, the Holy Ghost showed up. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Let me do this because it's in me to do it. And, uh, you know, I said I got off track from the beginning. But let me thank uh, Pastor Tommy and Pastor Lynette Roberts for the open door and the great hospitality I have received from my beginning time here in, well, it was Tiffin in Iowa period, but in Coralville, Iowa, 
Would you please put your hands together for this great man and woman of God? Just do that for me. Hallelujah. You are a blessing. You bless me. Amen. I think you know, only person knows more than you is JT, that I would be dead. I'd be dead. I'd be in heaven. Look, I, I'm just saying, I believe I would because I was there. And expecting to open my eyes to the sound of the, of the trump of God. And they showed up. He showed up. They showed up in, in Iowa. And I'm like, what are y'all? Okay, all this. I was not comfortable with them gathering up everything from my apartment in, in Arlington, Texas. And uh, putting stuff in storage. And, uh, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> now look at you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I was, I was always strong. Yeah. I was raised to be strong with JT's son. JT Senior, not the third. <laughs> he is my son. He may be your nephew doing all that stuff around here, but he's still my son. You can, you can use him as long as God wants you to have him. <laughs> yeah, one thing I'm sure of is that you will take care of him. Um, but uh, he said something to me. I don't even know if he remembered how he said it. He said, I didn't. He said, you may leave here, but you won't leave here on him. He will not be the one to discover you like that. Because he had to go to work. He'd leave me at, at home. And, you can't, I don't, unless you've been there, I don't know if you can imagine the struggle of having done everything in your power and raised to be a man. It's not raised to be a punk. Yeah, I, wanna, I, wanna, I ain't say take your Holy Ghost, your shoe, put your shoes in. Like that. You know, and, I, and I, don't, I don't mean that any other way than, you know, man just needs to be a man. You need to do what you got to do. It's not always easy. You just got to do it. And, uh, and I, I, I didn't know how I'd tell my testimony or what part of it. I can't tell it all because it's too much. I been through, I've been through hell. You know, leading people is not always easy. Most of the time it's not easy, period. God just gives you some good times. But ministry is not done because it's easy to do. And some of y'all with titles, you still don't know what ministry is. You just got a title. Some of you newly ordained people, I love you dearly, but, you know, this is not hard ministry. You know? Hard ministry is moving, being in charge of the attitudes, the mindsets, the performance of people, and moving them from what they used to be on a prior leader, taking over that reality, having folks come against you, then... Growing it to the point where you can't even fit where you were because what you were doesn't fit you. Yeah. Moving to a hotel. A hotel that requires people who are faithful to God to come and set up every Sunday morning. With having, having, enough, having enough consideration, now catch me now because you might get mad, not to tear up the stuff. While you're setting it up. Because it matters that people's lives are represented by the money that went into buying the stuff. Yeah. And putting your energy, your best into it because that's ministry just as well as the one who has to get up here and preach. Yeah. And then, somebody say and then. Yeah. After all said and done, somebody got to take the stuff back down again. And they've got to be faithful. You can't afford to get a call on Sunday morning and say, ain't nobody here to help set up. How I know? I sat back there and watched. So I could keep my son from having to drive back and forth to the apartment. I could have said, he would have done it. I said, I ain't going at no 7.30 in the morning. Church don't start till 10. Come back and get me at 9.45, man. I've earned my rest. 
Come on, Dr. Andrea. That's my girl right there. You know I'm telling the truth. I know a lot of preachers would have done that. No, son. I'll see you at 945. Not even for prayer. Prayer started, what, 940? They wouldn't have been here for prayer. Like, pick me up before the service starts. Then would have said it's character building. You have to come back and forth after all the stuff you're doing. I'm building character in you. Just come get your father. I'm preaching pretty good right now. But I get up because I'm like, well, I, I'm a softy, you know. I, I'm up anyway because I get up and pray. You know, you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and pray. Y'all don't, some of y'all don't know what that is. You pray from 3 to 7 because I don't have a job. So I'm on assignment, Brother Kelsey. I'm a warrior in the kingdom. So what, what do kingdom warriors do? They're going to prepare for war. And my greatest battle is in the heavenlies. For stuff some of y'all don't ever have to deal with because people are praying. Because they pray. Because leaders pray. You think because somebody's over a department that they got it easy? They better be praying over that department. Because if they got somebody operating under them, Tina, if you got somebody operating under you, you better be praying for them. Because you might get here one Sunday and say, where's my help? Have you prayed for them? Because it's your responsibility to deal with the demons they deal with. Leadership is not something where you get a title. It's something where you get responsibility and accountability. You got to be able to answer to the one you submit to. Have you done what you expected of you so that he can say, God, I did what's expected of me. So when I'm covering churches, I have to pray for leaders. I don't know what foolishness they got going on in their lives. Let the Holy Ghost tell me. Oh, y'all think every, every leader is holy? You think every leader prays? The Lord told me leaders are the ones who don't pray. When you have a leader who does pray, you're in a great position. Because there's somebody who watches for your soul. I promise you there are things you have not gone through because you've had covering over your life. And if you're under the right covering, everything changes. So when you got people who are faithful to, to show up and do all these things, that's, that's, that's major. That's a major blessing. Oh, yeah. Did it many years and, and wondered sometimes. And you have, sometimes you have to handle correction. That's not fun. And if you got people who don't want to take correction, then you really ain't got nothing. Yeah, I said you ain't got nothing. It's a waste of time. All you're doing is run your mouth. Ba, 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 ba. You'd rather run your mouth praying the Holy Ghost. Shiba na koro do kosina na 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 basina. Ain't got no time to preach a good message and you ain't coming to prayer? That's basic. Well, am I on my mind? No. No. Nowhere near what I got down here. It started with the mic. But you know what? I was taught I earned this kind of preaching. I've been doing this a long time. I'm not trying to impress you. Don't need to. Y'all don't pay my bills. My life is not my own. When I was on my deathbed, somebody told me that because I didn't want to preach no more. No, I'm done. Y'all can, I'll, I'll say amen to all y'all preaching and glory to God. Go on and do it. And I asked somebody, I asked somebody, I said, now I, if Hezekiah, Dave, you, you tell me, if Hezekiah was a faithful king, right? Hezekiah was a good king. He knocked out the, 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 the worship of Baal in the country and lived faithfully. Isaiah walks up to him at the authority of God and says, get your house in order. Today, God's going to bring you home. And he heard that word, and he thought about it. I've been faithful. Some of y'all got to stay with me here. I've been faithful. Long time. You know, my ancestors weren't always faithful. But God chose me, and I've been faithful. And he turned his face to the wall, and he said, Lord, I don't want to die. I'm not ready to go. 
but he'd been faithful to God. So God said, all right, Isaiah, he didn't talk to Hezekiah. He talked to the man he told to get a word. Y'all didn't get that. He didn't say nothing. Nothing. God never spoke to Hezekiah. He spoke to his man. He said, go back and tell him. He got 15 more years. You go tell him. I could have told him. You don't think God could have just said, Hezekiah, you got, here, you got 15 years. No, he said, your assignment was to tell him, get his house in order. And he responded to your word. Man, I feel that right now. I'm preaching better than some amens coming here. Now you go back and tell him, I've changed my mind. I can run on that one. I changed my mind. He's got 15 more years. But I got to tell you something. That was the worst prayer he ever could have prayed. Because <laughs> if he hadn't got those 15 more years, read your Bible, as my dad used to say. Read your Bible. He wouldn't have had the wrong son. He wouldn't have married the wrong woman, had the wrong son, who tore down his legacy and messed up. He'd have gone on to heaven with a good legacy. Now he had to live producing something that messed up everything he did. He prayed the wrong prayer. But God responded to his prayer. Can I say God will give you something you ask for, but you might not be asking for the right thing. If I don't say nothing else today, I just gave you a word. Write this down, Acts 15, 28. Just write that down. Acts 15, 28. God was moving. Bro, Mike, I love them boots, man. I don't see what he was talking about. Good Lord. Them bad boots right there. <laughs> God was moving on the Gentiles. And they came back and told the apostles, there's, there's some activity going on. It's not ours. It's, it's God using the Gentiles. And in that, in that process, they saw the Holy Ghost falling. So there was... God's work being done, and they had to have a solution because they were in charge. They were the apostles in charge. And they said, well, we need to go pray, and we'll come back and tell you how to. Because they said, some were saying they need to be circumcised like us. And then others said, no, 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 no. Ooh, I hear this. They're not us. They're not Jews. They weren't raised like we were raised. Man, I can. Not everybody comes from the same place you come from. Not about not be able to sit in the age, no, no, ha. Oh, glory to God. Not everybody has the same experience you have. But they're all God's people. They all love the Lord. They're all willing to raise their hands. They all feel his presence. Glory to God. We cannot require everybody just because they say Jesus to act like us. We cannot act like that just because they don't, mm, they don't do like other churches do. Uh, you may not be on international television yet, but it's coming. Not because you require it, not because you desire it, but because God commands it, and it's coming. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen to that. They said, we got to go check this out because we need to have some order. We're, we're in charge. We've been tasked with being in charge. They come back after they prayed, and they said, this is what we're going to do. We wrote these, this long letter. The Bible says they wrote this letter. And it says in the letter, we wrote what seemed good to us and to the Holy Ghost. This is what we expect for you all to do. But it seemed good to us and to the Holy Ghost. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Not to place on you any greater burden than these essentials. Acts 15, 28. When well, I said, because what you got to do is get in your heart that whatever God tells you needs to seem good to the Holy Ghost and to you. You shouldn't make a move unless you're sure the Holy Ghost is in it. You shouldn't make a move because it feels good. You shouldn't make a move because you like the way it looks. You should never make a move because somebody else did it. I got, I got news for you. God is always going to do what is right for you and the people he needs you to reach. He's going to give you an assignment that's bigger than you that only can be done through you and his participation. Otherwise, it's not worth doing. 
And Christian, though, you may be struggling a little bit right now. This is what the Lord told me to tell you, man. You're in a good season in your life. As a matter of fact, his hand is wide open over you. Glory to God. And I don't know all the things you've been dealing with, but this is what I hear the Lord saying. Just take hope. Hope is expectation with delight. Because faith is the substance, the thing on which you stand. Faith is the substance, the thing on which you stand. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you don't have hope, you never have any faith. If you don't have hope, you never have anything to stand on. So hold your hope. If you hold your hope, God will bring blessing to the hope. See, he said, you're here in faith. But he said, don't release the hope. Because your hope will not make you ashamed. Somebody give God some praise for that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And whether you know it or not, I'm almost done. <laughs> but let me tell you, let me do this, because um, it's just the way it turned out. I'm sorry you messed me up, so anyway. <laughs> a whole lot of stuff messed me up, threw me off track. I thought I was going to be able to get up the day, the other day and just do a nice flow. I had it ready. So I'm here thanking them for the opportunity, but I didn't come alone. Let me just say, these great people came from Atlanta. McDonough is where they actually live, but their ministry is Atlanta. That's the Atlanta area. Atlanta, Georgia. You know something about that, don't you? Okay. <laughs> Apostle and Pastor Stroman. Put your hands together one more time for them. <laughs> my friends. They're my friends. We met about 20 years ago or so. Somewhere around there. <laughs> and he was praying at a church dedication of one of our bishops in our group we had. And I don't think he was bishop then, but anyway, I don't know if he was or not. But uh, anyway, he had opened a new church, and so I was the assistant presiding bishop at that time, and myself and the other bishop were down there. And I, he said, we're going to open with prayer. And this man started praying. <clears throat> Some of y'all might not be able to tell the difference. But he started praying that the word of God be alive, and faith without works is dead, and in this place, and and we thank God that he'll have what he says. And I'm like, hold up. That sounds too much like Dad Hagen to me. I'm like, where does this guy come from? I don't know him. And as he started praying, I heard God. I was like, I need to know him. And to this day, he's seen me through some of my worst times. He didn't say something like, oh, I'm under you. So I was like, no, 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 we're friends. But somebody, the Bible says, you know, a friend loves at all times. There is a brother loves at all times, but there's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. For the, you know, some are made for adversity. And uh, I got two people here, two men, I got some other folks here too, but two men here today, a part of my life, who are made for my adversity. That's your pastor, and that's my friend, Apostle David Stroman. I uh, used to hesitate to say this, but I'll say it because it's true and God already knows it. They've heard me cry on the phone. <clears throat> and my daddy didn't raise me to cry. To nobody, you know, but they, they have heard me and loved me, and they're still my friends. Yeah. And they both esteem me highly. That's got to be God, because I was pretty weak. I was pretty messed up. When you start snotting and slobbering, they didn't see it. <laughs> As a man. <laughs> And they heard it after I was already consecrated bishop. No, I ain't talking about a long time ago. I'm talking about, you know, I'm carrying an office. I'm walking in an office and covering people. And I'm like, you know, I didn't know it could be this bad. Of course, I can't tell y'all everything I went through. But I went through some stuff. And didn't have nobody. Because the leaders over me didn't know how to minister to me. Can't lead people you can't minister to. Can't leave people you can't have compassion for. Bye bye. She don't know. Bible says Jesus had compassion. He didn't judge people. Rulers come to him. Watch this. He was the carpenter's son in the natural. And rulers came to him. And said, rulers. And he had compassion for them and was able to minister them out of their situation into the place of God. 
That's a leader. Yeah, judge you because you got a title. Judge you because you got more money than me. Judge you because you drive a better car than me. I got news for you. There's something in you. Say me. Because I can't call every one of your names. But I'm talking to you. There's something in you that the world needs. There's something in you that everybody else needs. Or God wouldn't have you here. I said God wouldn't have you here if there wasn't something in you that people need. And he's been preparing you to release it. He's been putting you in position to release what he's pouring into you. And I can tell you from experience that sometimes you can walk into the right place at the right time and change somebody's world. You know what I'm talking about? Through all the hell, through losing everything, lost my marriage, lost two houses, multiple cars, my bank account. I mean, I lost some money. Two churches. That's everything I had. The only thing I didn't lose was my children. I mean, that was mine. I mean, you, you mine, but you know, I'm talking about, you know, they love me. That man right there, he loved me. That one in California loved me. He done added his wife. She loved me. And I got a daughter in Durham, North Carolina. She loved me. She getting ready to get married. I hope he loved me because they love me. <laughs> Grandkids that love me. Glory to God. But I was alone. Technically, still am, but not in the spirit. Because I was preaching, which I wouldn't have been doing. Y'all hearing my story. Wouldn't have been preaching. Like I'm preaching. If this woman right here had left me alone. I asked her, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I'm tired. You know, I'm ready to cross over, Angie. Just they won't, the God won't let me in. I'm knocking on the door. He wouldn't let me in. Yeah, I told you, just, I tried Hezekiah's route, only on the reverse. I did, literally. I thought, well, Hezekiah got 15 years, you know, added by asking. He was a good man. You know, I said good boy because I was raised in the church to be a good boy. So I said, Lord, I'm good like Hezekiah. That's so what I said. I said, I, I, I'm good like Hezekiah, and I don't want to stay. I'm ready to go. But then you know there's a scripture in the word that says that he who loves his life will lose it. He that hates his life will find it. I hated my life. I said, no, Lord, don't do that to me. That ain't fair. You ain't playing fair. I don't ask telling you I've done everything you asked me to do. Just take me home. I'm sorry. This is not the church I planned for y'all this morning. <laughs> and then he says to me, your life's not your own. Like, I don't know if I need to hear that. And she says to me, oh, you're going to be back out there? Doing this and that. I was like, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> don't say that to me no more. And then I went to him and said, Would you tell her to stop? <laughs> I don't know if they talk about that, but I'm just telling you. I told him, Would you ask her to just stop? Just back off. <laughs> y'all, yeah, I don't know if y'all ever seen me get multiple hugs from her every time I see her. Because <laughs> she had life to me. I'm pulling. Amen. I'm pulling. I don't mind getting hugs from Dave. I don't mind. Hugging, you know, Mike. I don't hug Mike. I'm pulling. Because I realize, I realize personally how important it is to share life with one another. To fellowship with one another. To impart to one another. Because none of us can do this on our own. So since I got enough life to go back out and preach some more, I happen to be preaching Brenda, I, 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 Deborah, I, I happened to be preaching in Syracuse, New York at a conference that I was presiding over again, elevating another man as an apostle. And I'm chilling, sitting in the corner of the pews. I didn't plan this. I'm sitting at, Andrew, you're bad. I'm sitting in the corner of the pews. She ain't helping me out either. She's egging it on. 
And the way the church was situated, I could sit in the corner on the pews and see people coming in. And I'm observing. Now, purposely observing because, you know, I'm paying attention to spiritual things in the, in the ministry, in the church. But these people walked in. And I observed. <laughs> Apostle, I observed. <laughs> I knew the daddy, Deacon Simon. I didn't know him. He's just too distinct. He's a little older now, but I knew him. But I didn't know the woman behind him. And then there was another woman behind him, and she was classy. You know, there was two women, women were classy. So I was like, okay. <laughs> but I really didn't focus on the older woman. She just looked like an old, good-looking mama in the church. <laughs> you know, like, she had it together, man. She had the wrap on and little shade-looking stuff on her eyes. And I was like, that's a, that's a classy mother. But there was this one in between who looked like she was in charge. And I was like, okay. But, now here's the real deal. Service went on. She greeted my spiritual daughter. I was like, oh, okay. Now there's really something up because how does she know Jackie? And they're hugging each other like they've been well acquainted. And then uh, the service went on. I don't know if, how many of you know uh, Pastor John Hanna. Pastor John Hanna, if you ever know anything about uh, prayer warrior preachers, He's got thousands of members. He may have the largest church in America right now based on prayer. And uh, he was preaching that, that night, and he, he went in. When he went in, I heard this voice. Saying, Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Nobody else, everybody else was quietly receiving, but somebody else was aggressively going after God. And that's what caught my attention. I'm like, whoa, whoa, I hear God coming in here. And I looked up, and it was this woman right here. And I was like, I need to know her. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you a little bit of, of what I said to her. I got, I got, <laughs> I said a little bit. Look at Jack, Zach stood up. Zach stood up. All right, this is not the service I planned. <laughs> Zach stood up. Like, I want to hear this. Dude, I'm on mic, man. What in the world? It's like the EF Hutton talks, people listen. Y'all know there's an anointing in this house right now. Glory to God. <laughs> Lord, this is yours. Jackie hooked it up, my daughter, Jacqueline Cuthrell. Um, I'm sure you'll meet her sometime. And arranged for her to come to the service was the affirmation service for the apostles the next day. You know, I had to ceremonially um, release him as an apostle and uh, she agreed to come and we went through the service and went out to eat afterward I'm like man I expect all this is kind of my style I know I got to catch a plane in the morning and I need to talk to this woman and uh, <laughs> I don't know when I'm gonna be able to do it Kathy you ain't helping either you back there <laughs> okay oh, I know I hit it that time I saw myself <laughs> Uh, but after dinner, I rode in the car with her and I said, can we talk or do I need to go because you got to go home? She's like, no, we can talk. Three hours later, I said, I got to get out of here because I got to pack because I got to catch a plane. Or I kept talking. But in the midst of talking, I said to her, I said, I'll marry you right now. <laughs> I didn't mean it was all like that. Thank you. I felt God. Sometimes you know when it's right, and you know God is in something. I said, now there'd be some logistical issues. <laughs> you know, well, there's been a lot. <laughs> you can't just do something like that without, you got to go through something. But I said, I can do it right now. I know what's on you. And you're not a bad looking woman. <laughs> I'm being real. <laughs> she looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> so I said, I said, can I talk to you again or am I, have I scared you away? And she said, give me your phone. <laughs> can I see your hand? You're just looking up at my hair. This right here, she's wearing that right there. Uh, Do 
this is, this is God's doing. Tasha and I got engaged on December 31st, crossing into the new year. And uh, why? Not because I went there looking for a wife or she came there looking for a husband. But God wanted us to be together for the assignment that's ahead of us. Within that same season, he, he assigned me to Los Angeles. And now we have a team of at least six people who are who are intimately involved in planning. And this is something different than we've done before. I used to go places, preach, shout, get some folks come, let's start a church. Now we are planning. We have video presentations, Bible study presentations. I've written two books since y'all seen me. Man. And starting my third, I'm giving myself to the first, I'm taking a break. So the first of April, I'll start on number three. Now I've written some before, but through the loss of ministry, I lost them. I had six manuscripts that got kind of swept away. But I found out that they weren't relevant for today. So everything is fresh. Each one of you is a part of the plan of God for today. Why haven't you been released before? Hello, somebody. Because God's got something to do today. See, why is, why is it that you're just now preparing to build this church? Because God's not through. God may have saved you years ago, some of you, but he hadn't finished you, he hadn't released you yet. So he's preparing for the release. He's preparing you. My message today was supposed to be, I choose this life. And I can still say that, I chose this life. I chose this life because of St. John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever, I'm a whosoever. Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's when I chose this life. I found out there was a God who loved me beyond myself. And then, in order to get it to me, he ran us through Acts chapter 2 and says, On the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, they were all in one room and in one place. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly, there came a sound. I got news for you. When God gets ready to do something in your life, you will be a sound. A certain sound will change things in your life. You say, well, I didn't hear the wind. No, but there's a sound. Even if it's just the sound of the word of God. Even if it's just the sound of somebody preaching. Even if it's the sound of somebody praying. Can I tell you one of the most important sounds in the atmosphere is the sound of prayer. There's another sound of praise. There's another sound of worship. But there will always be a sound of the move of God. And that kept me here. The Holy Ghost. Somebody say the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost came. Hallelujah. Ha, ah, Boshina. Mike, the Holy Ghost is on me. Hallelujah. And when he comes, the Bible says, he will lead you into all truth and righteousness. There's stuff he wants to tell some of you, but you're not able to bear it now. John, John 12, 20, 16, 12, excuse me. He said, you can't bear it now. He said, but when the Comforter has come, he will teach you all things. He will tell you. He will talk about me. Glory to God. He told him, he said, I got a whole lot I can tell you, but it ain't time yet. But there's a time coming. Glory to God. And I can tell you right now, there's a time in life point that has arrived for you to see manifestations and revelations of the power of God. This is a season of demonstration that will only come through the Holy Ghost. Through the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Miracles, signs, wonders. They come from expectation. People who are in place. People who are ready to receive. People who don't mind setting up on Sunday morning and taking down on Sunday afternoon. People who don't mind showing up and praising God. People who don't mind dancing up here to give God your offering. People who don't mind supporting a vision that you're doing your best to be a part of. That's when it comes. Glory to God. I chose this life through going through hell. 17 major cancer operations. I chose this life through losing everything I thought I had. I chose this life. But I still believe. I was raised on the word. I fell into the word of faith. Like he preaches, I followed those guys before he knew who they were. I was a partner with Jerry Savelle before he knew who Kenneth Copeland was. 
Glory to God. But I, through all of that, didn't see it happen for me the way I thought it was going to happen. I never believed that I would have to have an operation. I resisted it to the end. Dr. King looked at me that day in the, in the emergency room trying to tell me. I knew she had never seen the tumorous manifestations that were in my body. I knew because no, they hadn't seen it. I know. It wasn't my first day. And in doing that, I told her, I said, you ain't seen it like this. Ah, I've seen it. I've heard that. I've seen everything. And people say that all the time. I said, can they turn away? I don't even want them to see this. And I opened the gown, and her mouth dropped. And she said, nope, I ain't never seen that before. And they started immediately. Didn't even let me go home. Kept me at the hospital up there, the University of Iowa. And she said, you got no quality of life now. Why don't you at least just let us do something? I chose this life. And in the midst of it, you know what? I still love God. People say, were you mad at God? I've never been mad at God a day in my life. Never been mad at God. You know who I was mad at? Me. I figured it had to be something wrong with me. Because the Bible says I can have what I say. But you know what I said? I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm delivered. I never said I won't have an operation. Doctor, I never said that. So however God did it, look at somebody say God did it. However he does it, God does it. You know what I decided the other day? Is that I love God. I chose this life because I love a God who loves me. If you don't love a God who loves you, there's no reason for you to keep going because something's going to happen to you that's going to mess with your reason for being here. Because the devil's not going to quit. Your enemy's not going to quit, whatever you want to call him. Your adversary's not going to quit. He knows his end. He knows his end. He's hoping you don't know yours. He's hoping he can get you to change your mind, to partner with him, to come over to the wild side. Before Jesus comes back. He knows his end. Do you know yours? Do you know yours? I'm living eternally with my friend, Jesus, my older brother, with the Father God. I have an eternal destiny with him. And it's already in reality now. Because now am I the son of God. It does not yet appear what I shall be. But when he shall appear, I'm going to be like him. Gonna say, there he is. There he is. There she is. Now, if you're waiting for a future revelation, you're going to miss it. You've got to receive it now. I chose this life because right now, he prepared a good life for me to live. One of the greatest scriptures in the Bible is Ephesians 2.10. <laughs> Especially in the Amplified Bible. He prepared ahead of time the good life. The good life for us to walk in. I don't know if they got that one. That's a good one right there. Ephesians 2.10. And Brother Jerry was coming with that one. I don't know if he's going to preach that tonight. But I got that from him years ago. I was like, man, I ain't never read that scripture before in my life. That was about 20 years ago. He prepared the good life ahead of time. You think you're going through now, and I'm going to close. You might be dealing with something now, but God already prepared the good life. I chose this life because I knew I was choosing the good life. I stay in this life because God still prepared a better life than what I'm living right now. I'm living a good life. I'm, how many people? 17. None of some people had many operations, but I ain't even tell y'all that I woke up in the first one. Oh. Woke up screaming because they were cutting me. And they pushed me down and did their best to get me back out. The anesthesiologist came to me a few days later. Bless my soul. I didn't even recognize him. He didn't have all the, you know, the, the scrubs on, stuff like that. He had on his nice white coat, professional looking, look all clean. 
I'm like, who's this guy? Come walking up in here. He said, I just want to check on you. Because he said, I owe you an apology. I said, what do you need to apologize to me for? He said, because I'm the reason you had a bad time in the surgery. I'm like, you are? He said, you're not an ordinary man. He said, I underestimated who you are. I was like, wow. I didn't, mean, I, I didn't think of nothing like that. I was just getting an operation. Didn't really care about the operation. I was still trying to say, you know, I could go to sleep in this operation and I'd be fine. Yes, yeah, it. Let me see the other side. I was, I was going in, people going to operation scared. Oh, I'm like, not me. Operate on me. Just don't let me wake up screaming. <laughs> but uh, he comes over to me. He says, I, I just want to let you know that it was my fault. It's like, I'm not mad at you. You know? I don't, I don't know what, what the problem is. I see, because it wasn't, didn't stay with me. When you walk in forgiveness, stuff don't stay with you. People bring it back up. I'm like, you don't need to talk about this because this is done. Come on now. Don't give Satan the advantage. Who You forgive, I forgive. Who you love, I love. That's the Corinthians 2.10. He said, he said uh, so Satan doesn't get the advantage. He said, but he said, he said I, I just don't want you to feel like I didn't know. It was a challenge for you. He put his hand on my shoulder. He put his hand on my shoulder. And I said, uh, immediately, Holy Spirit said, put your hand on him. You know. Brother Dave, you get some hugs, but I put a clamp on his hand. Just as strong as you hug, I, I held his hand. And the Holy Spirit said, now pray with him. And I said, you know what? Let's just share a word of prayer. And then immediately, he's doing this. Trying to pull his hand out. I was like, I got you, man. I was like, it's okay. I said, it's okay. I, it really won't, it won't be hard. I won't make noise. I said, I know how to do this. I've done this a long time. And he relaxed. And I prayed. And I said, Lord, you know him better than I do. You know what he needs. You heal him. Let him know I'm not mad. And you're not mad. It's going to be okay. Change his life. In Jesus' name. It's just simple. I didn't get all deep. One time for that. This man didn't do it. I wasn't trying to scare him to death. I just wanted to pray for him. Come on, y'all got to know when to be deep and when to be real. Thank you. Raise your hand to that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But when I released his hand, Janice, I released his hand. I looked at him. And he pulled his glasses off. He's slotting, snotting, and slobbering. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> he said, you fool of that spirit, ain't you? <laughs> I said, yes. I call him Holy Spirit, but yeah. You. And I said, God wants to change your life. You're not going to be the same. He said, no, I'll never be the same again. I'll never be the same again. I said, if, it, if nothing else, if I had to have the operation to get his life impacted by the power of God, it's worth it. What's an eternity with God? What's an operation compared to my eternity with God? If this man makes it in, and the nurses who I prayed for later, if they make it in, and all I had to do was go to sleep, let them practice. <laughs> right? They practice. They don't say they're practicing physicians. Uh -huh. Legally, right? You're practicing physicians. And then I wake back up. Now, granted, wasn't an easy operation, but I'm standing here. All cut up. I got go. Well, you can't see all the scars. I chose this life with all this other stuff I said. You still got to choose this life. It's a good life. God prepared a good life. And can I tell you this? You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. This stuff's getting good. We're living in a time of the good stuff right here. God's not going to Some of y'all think y'all getting old and it's about time to go. God said you're not going nowhere. I had to creep. No funerals. God's going to do it. Now, you can go if you want to. Some of y'all can go if you want to. I couldn't. But I heard the Lord say, some of y'all can go if you want to because you, you've done some things that I haven't done yet. But God said, the devil's not going to kill you. 
The devil can't kill you. No accidents. Somebody say no accidents. No tragedies. No sickness and disease will cause me to leave this earth in Jesus' name. I want to pray. I want to pray. Rest assured, I did not preach what I planned, but I did say to the Holy Ghost in the beginning, this is your service. Glory to God. This is your service. You know the changes that have been made because you were in the process. And you know the results that you expect. Hallelujah. Some of you struggle. I struggled, so I know. I hear the Lord. Some of you have struggled and are struggling with why you do what you do. Why are you here? Well, you know, there must be something real about this. Because not only have I been doing this since I was a, literally a child. Before they allowed me to say I was saved, I was saying I was saved. Not everybody's lived that way. It's okay. I don't have the kind of testimony some of you all delivered from drugs and alcohol and different types of sinful things. My sin was I didn't know I was saved. Didn't know Jesus had died for me. Didn't know I was great in the plan of God. I needed to be saved. I needed to be changed. And God changed me. He had me preaching before they gave me a license. But you know what the greatest gift he gave me in ministry? is being able to be relevant and practical. I had some stuff that I thought was relevant and practical, but it still wasn't what he wanted. What he wanted was to touch your life today. And for you to know that this is real chose my, this life to allow me to go through all those surgeries, go through all the loss, and you only know part of the story. I didn't even tell you about the aneurysm I had, whether they thought I was going to die then, should have been dead. I've heard that so much from doctors. Why are you still alive? Should have been dead, should have been dead. I didn't tell you about the car accident where the snow plow in New York picked the car up off the road, spun it around the air, rolled it over in the grass, and the snow plow drivers thought I was dead. And they were shocked when the ambulance men pulled me out of the car alive. God kept me here. God has kept you here. In spite of the enemy's attempt to destroy you. And rest assured, some stuff you don't even know that the enemy's tried to destroy you in. God just blocked it. Hey, bo, shay, and and I. He chose you before the foundation of the world to make an impact on others. That's why he lets you hear the word of God the way you hear it. That's why he let you come to the rowdy crew. Oh, you know everybody don't act like this in church. He let you join with this congregation of people for a reason. Because there's somebody only you can reach. You didn't know it when you started believing in God. But he wants you to know that there's something he needs to do. And there's somebody in your bloodline whose life needs to be changed. And he chose you to make a difference.